Hi, this is Pastor Ken from Park Place Community Church, and we want to thank you for watching this teaching video. We hope that it's a blessing and a help to you. God bless you. I want to welcome you to church this morning. I also want to thank everybody for the um, great Christmas uh, gift you all gave to me um, this year, a great Amazon gift card. I have my Amazon list already made out, and uh, of course, the cool card that is a signature, I think probably made by Ada card, I'm guessing, um, super cool um, card, so thank you so much for that. I also wanted to... Um, and well, not announce, but see if we can get some um, interest in it. We've had some guys that have been expressing interest in a midweek Bible study. Um, so I would love to do a men's Bible study um, Tuesday evening, 6 or 7, something like that works good. But if you have different ideas, I'm open to that. But uh, men, if you want to have a midweek Bible study, would you just let me know that? And, and if we get enough interest, um, we would love to do that. And I just want to, sometimes men... Um, are hesitant to go to a Bible study because they're concerned that they'll have to talk or somebody will call them out or ask them a question. I guarantee you, I've been teaching men's Bible studies for years. I guarantee you one thing, you will never have to say anything. I will never ask like group questions or anything like that. Men don't like stuff like that. They, they don't want anybody to find out um, how how can I say this nicely? How little they know about the Bible. Um, you will never, I, in my Bible studies, nobody will know if you're the smartest guy in the room or the dumbest guy in the room. So don't let that keep you from that. We just come together and I teach just basically verse by verse through the Bible. So if you're interested in that, um, let me know so we can get that started. So... Happy New Year. It's a new year. First day of the new year, 2023. And uh, it's just good to see you guys. It seems like so long. I haven't seen you since last year. <laughs> we have to do all the dumb New Year's jokes, right? That Man, I hope I remember how to preach. I haven't preached since last year, you know. But it, it's the new year, and last week we finished our series called The Greatest Gift, and uh, man, it was a significant time. Um, the service that we had on Christmas Eve, that was our Christmas service, and two, many significant things happened, but two particular significant things happened um, in that series. The first one being that we asked ourselves a very important question. Will we allow God to interrupt our lives so we can invite other people to take one step closer to Jesus? Will we allow God? God wants to. He wants to interrupt our, our daily life so that we will invite people to take one step closer to him. And again, I clarified it. I'm not asking you to do a Billy Graham crusade in the parking lot of your work. I'm not asking anything like that. It's just I believe that God wants to interrupt our lives so we will invite people to take one step closer to him. And a lot of times that's going to look like inviting somebody to church, you know. We, we all have people that we bump into on a daily basis that are struggling and have needs in their life. And just a simple invite. So we got the invite cards, the business cards, um, that you can just hand to them and say, hey, I think this would help you, and, and just invite them to church. So um, hopefully everybody will be a part of that. And then a very significant thing that we did on that Christmas Eve service is we as a church adopted two families and we gave them Christmas gifts to, to the kids and to the moms, um, two single moms, lots of kids. And come on, somebody, those bags were huge. There were some of the, the little boys that they couldn't even lift it. They had to drag it down the aisle 
to get it out of the church. So um, that was a very significant thing. And I, I just want to say I'm so proud of you guys for coming together to do that, to bless these two families. And in this current series that we're starting this morning, I will be referencing that more to kind of uh, explain the flavor of our church. But isn't it interesting that during the week between Christmas and New Year's, there's usually like a day or two where it just kind of seems like time stops, right? And we're, we're looking back at the old year and looking forward at the new year to come. It's almost like we're in this limbo, time-stopped, you know, thing where we're kind of in between years. And how many of you know it's always easier when we look back and evaluate our life it's easier to see the negative things, right? It's easier to see the, the losses than the wins. It's easier to see the negative and not the positive. I think that's just human nature. And it's in this evaluation um, process that has us setting New Year's resolutions, right? We, we look back at the previous year and we see things that we want to change. We see things that we don't want to see in, in this next year. So we make these New Year's resolutions to try to, to, to get those things out of our lives. We want things to be different in our future. And sometime this month or the next month, we'll get into, we'll talk about real life change. Because how many of you figured out New Year's resolutions don't work? <laughs> they don't do that. They typically don't create real life change. So we will talk about that. But we're going to do things a little bit different um, this year going into the new year. Typically, Today, I would preach some rah rah message of let's tear it up in the new year. Let's, you know, make all these changes. Let's, you know, get, we, we have these terms of get a fresh start or a new beginning. That's just kind of who I am. One of the other things that I do is I do coaching for business people, and business people typically, you know, want to set goals. And I'm not against that, I'm for that, you know, for the new year. And I actually already started on social media talking about what I was going to teach in this new series. I start talking about a series called All Things New, and we will get to that. But, you know, this time of year, this thinking of, you know, the fresh start or the new beginning, what I want to talk about this morning is what if we don't need a fresh start, what if we just need to keep going? What, what if we just need to keep doing what we're doing? Because if you have put your faith in Jesus, you already have that fresh start. You, you've already got that. We see it here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. It says, we are careful not to judge people by what they seem to be, though we once judged Christ in this way, when anyone is in Christ, if you've sown your life into Christ, it's a whole new world. The old things are gone, and suddenly everything is what? New. When you sow your life into Christ, when you accept Christ, when you put your faith in Him, the Bible says it's a whole new world. That's your fresh start. That's your new beginning. Everything is new. So that means that your relationship with God is family. Before you accepted Christ, you were outside the family, but now once you've accepted Christ, your relationship is family, and your status with God is forgiven. All the stuff that you've done in your past, it's already been forgiven. You have had your fresh start. Now, we've talked about this before, this scripture that says that everything is new, all things become new. 
when you first accept Christ, that newness is in your spirit. And, you know, your spirit is 100% created, 100% new. What's out here, what you do, doesn't change overnight. How many of you know, if you're an alcoholic and you get saved, you're an alcoholic after you get saved on the outside, not on the inside. Everything is made new on the inside. It's just a matter of walking out on the outside the reality that has happened on the inside. So let me introduce this new series this morning with an illustration. I I want everybody just to take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath in. Doesn't that feel good? Let's do it again. Take a deep breath. Oh, that feels so good. Now, what I want to do now, I'm going to um, get my timer here. I want us to take a deep breath in, and then I want us to hold it for 10 seconds. Okay, you ready? Okay, you can breathe. Whew. Okay, now I want us to take a deep breath in, and then I want us to hold it until I tell you to release it. Okay, you ready? Okay, you can release it. Now, didn't some of you kind of start to panic a little bit on that last one? Like when I told you it was going to be for 10 seconds, you knew, okay, I can make it for 10 seconds. But when I said, hold it until I let you know, you don't know how long it's going to be, right? So I think some of us, I could see it on your face, marked back there with this, you're really constrained. You know, I think some of us, we started to panic because we didn't know how long it was going to be. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you ever feel like life is holding your breath? (laughs) Like in life, it feels like you're holding your breath. You you, you don't know if you can keep going. You don't know if you're going to make it in life. Maybe you get a little panicked in life. I know I have felt that way. So the title of the new series this morning is called Just Breathe. <laughs> just, just breathe. How many of you felt like that guy laying down on the pavement at the end of 2022? <laughs> like you just cross a line, you fell out, passed out, you can barely breathe. What, what this series is about is in life, just breathe. No matter where you are, no matter, you know, your finish line, how you felt, if you felt like that guy, just breathe. How many of you seen in the races like marathons or triathlons, you know, there's guys trotting over the finish line, and then there's some people, you know, when you've given that much, sometimes your body just shuts down, and there's people just crawling on all fours over the finish line. I shouldn't laugh at it, but I actually look on YouTube at these, and sometimes they're so funny, even though for the person at the time it's not funny, but there's sometimes we're crossing the finish line on all fours, just crawling. In in this message this morning, we're going to be using running a race like that as an analogy. Because the Bible uses this analogy often comparing life with a distance race. And if you've ever run distance, you know that it takes more than strength and power and speed It takes what we talk a lot about here at Park Place. It takes vision. It takes intent. It takes strategy. And it takes endurance. See, when you run for distance, you need to find your own pace. 
like, like you're running along and you see a hill coming up. So maybe you back it off a little bit to save up a little energy to make it up that hill. Maybe there's a downhill that you, you know, gain a little energy so for the next mile or two you can pick up the pace a little bit. But you need to find that pace and you can't sprint a marathon. How many of you know, when you're running that distance, you can't sprint the whole thing. You won't finish. You'll never get to the finish line. And life is a marathon, so we want to finish. The Bible tells us in several different places. Let's just look at a few of them. In Isaiah 40, verse 31, or 30 through 31, it says, Even youth will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Here's my favorite one, Hebrews 12.1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now, this next one, we're going to spend a little bit more time on this morning. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, um, verse 24 through 27. It starts out, it says, You know that in a race, all runners run, but only one runner gets the prize. So run like that. Run to win. All who compete in the games, you strict training. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here, in this race of life, we should give it our all. We should give everything that we have in this race of life. But that doesn't mean that we should always be sprinting. Because if you sprint, you're not going to finish the race. In a marathon, if you sprint, that's not a good strategy to win the race, because if you sprint, you won't finish, and if you don't finish, how many of you know you can't win? So, so again, we need our, our pace, because our goal is to win, and you can't win if you don't finish. It goes on, and it says, they, talking about the athletes, they do this so that they can win a prize, one that doesn't last. See, back in, in those times, they had these, you know, kind of like the Olympic Games that we have now, they'd have these um, competitions, and the person that won would get this, like, wreath crown made of real vines, you know, green leaves, and, and it looked great on the day of the race. But eventually it would die, right? The leaves would turn brown and it would, you know, so they would win this prize that was temporary, but it says we do it, we run this race of life for an eternal prize. The, the prize that we're going through, this race of life has eternal ramifications. So the Apostle Paul is saying that it will take strict training and intentional pacing for us to win this race so we can get to the finish line, and it's so worth it. See, this is not a race for a ribbon that goes in a box in the attic. How many of you have that box, you know, of all the ribbons that you won, you know, in contests or races? Or, and you never even look at them again, right? They just go in the box. This is not, this race of life is not for that ribbon that goes in a box in the attic. Our finish line is finally becoming completely and perfectly whole. But that will not happen until we die or Jesus comes back, whichever comes first. So we're in this race for the long haul. We're in this race of life 
for a lifetime. So we just keep running. Verse 26, it says, So I run like someone who has a goal, and a goal of a race, again, is the finish line. So I run like someone that has a goal. I fight like a boxer who is not just shadow boxing. By the way, last week we had a championship boxer here with us, um, Golden Gloves Boxer. Now, now I think he does training or boxing coaching or something. But, but um, it, it says, I fight like a boxer who is not just shadow boxing, not just hitting the air. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should do. I do this so I won't miss getting the prize myself after telling others about it. And here's the thing. I think that we kind of blow it sometimes. We think, this is not true, you don't have to restart the race every time you blow it. See, God is not like Monopoly, where, where it says, go back to go, do not collect $200, you know. God does not, every time we blow it, say, okay, you have to restart the race. That, that's not what God does. That would not be productive, right? Because we'd never get anywhere if we had to restart every time we make a mistake. That's why it's important for us to realize that we are forgiven. See, when you blow it, when you make a mistake, he forgives you, dusts you off, and gets you right back in the race. He doesn't make you restart. So, defined by God, running a really good race just looks like not quitting. Not, not giving up in the race. It says this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. It says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. See, in the race of life, we will reap if we just keep going. If we just keep running. So to run a good race, you just have to keep running. That, that's how God defines a good race, is we just have to keep going. We just have to keep running. But it just so happens that the hardest part of the race is the running, right? The, the start is, you know, everybody's excited, has this anticipation. At the end, it's over, everybody's celebrating victory. It's that whole running thing in the middle that sucks, right? It's that whole running thing, you know, that, that is the hardest part. So how do we keep running? How do we keep moving when times get hard? So in closing this morning, let's look at an effective strategy for running. Now, for any of you who happen to be runners, and I don't totally understand why you would want to be <laughs> a runner, um, you would know the best strategy often in a race is to pick somebody else out and just keep your eyes on them. Just keep focus on them and keeping up with them. Actually, I have two friends that that's what they do. They're pacers. And they're very high-level athletes. One of them is a high-level triathlete, has competed in, I think, like six Ironmans. Very high level. And, and they go into a race and they wear a shirt of a certain color that says on the back what their pace is going to be. So that people can just say, I want to go that fast and just keep their eye on them and keep up with them in order to finish the race at a certain pace. And this really works. I've actually found this by experience. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, I am not a runner. <laughs> actually, I can't stand running. 
I, I really dislike running. When I run, my lower back just immediately starts to hurt. I mean, like if within eight to ten steps. My body is just not made for running. I strongly feel that the only reason you should be running is if something's chasing you. <laughs> like, there's no other reason to run than if something's chasing you. So if you get up on a morning like this morning, cool, crisp, don't go for a run. But if you're going out to get the mail and a pit bull starts chasing you, definitely go for it. Definitely run. So to me, running should not be called a sport. It should be called a survival tactic. <laughs> that you're running from something that's dangerous. But that's just my feelings. And I've always been that way. Actually, I've never, my whole life, I've never liked running. And... Um, so I've never ran, except this one time. <laughs> in junior high and high school, I had these two best friends. I mean, we were like the three amigos. We were always together. We did everything together, except when they were running. Because <laughs> both of them were star cross-country athletes at our high school. They were really into running. So that they did, I didn't participate in that. But this one time, they talked me into doing a race. And it was a 5K, right? That a 5K is just slightly over three miles. Not super far, but for somebody that's not a runner, it's pretty far. So my friends, they talked me into it. And one of my friends said, Ken, I will pace you. I will just be, you know, just a little bit in front of you. I'll be running at an easy pace. You just keep your eyes on me, and you'll be able to finish the race. But he said, because he's super competitive, he said, I'm only going to do that for half the race. And then I'll leave you and go on and, you know, try to get a good training run in or, you know. So we go to the race, and, and we start the race. And, and Mike, my friend, he, he starts out his easy jogging pace, you know, at an easy pace. The problem is his easy jogging pace is almost like a dead sprint for me. So I'm trying my best, you know, to keep up with him. And, and you know, I, I'm struggling, but I'm just keeping my eye on him. You know, I'm just you know, staying focused on him. And we get through about, you know, half the race. And then he just kind of looks back and gives me a nod and boom, he's gone. You know, he takes off. And so I'm just, you know, struggling to finish the race. Many times I felt like, this is stupid. I, I just wanted to quit and give up, you know. But I knew I would get razzed to no end if I did that. So I keep going, and I get to the end, and I think it must have been finished on a golf course because all I remember is just collapsing in this grass. And I'm laying there on my back, and I'm looking up, and everything's spinning like that fan is right now. Everything's spinning. The clouds are, you know, moving in this weird pattern. Everything around me is spinning. The angels are saying, just step into the light. Just step into, you know, I, I think I'm going to die, you know. And, and I'm looking up, and all of a sudden I see this face. And the mouth is moving. How many of you have been in that condition where somebody is talking to you, but they just sound like Charlie Brown's mom? <laughs> you know, you know they're talking, but you don't really know what they're saying. So I look up and I realize it's my friend Mike. And as oxygen starts to come back to my brain, I start to hear what he's saying. And he's saying, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. I'm like... Are you saying I only have five minutes to live? Like it's going to be the end, you know, after five minutes? But what he was saying was, because he's a runner, so he, he watches his splits and stuff. He was saying, the first mile, you ran a five-minute mile. 
I'd never run a five-minute mile in my life. I mean, for me, for football and wrestling, you just had to get under eight minutes, you know, for a mile. So, so, you know, a five-minute mile was like, whoa. I know to some really elite runners, that's not that big of a deal. But for me, it was huge. I had ran a five-minute mile. So, you know, this... Five minute mile, I, I figured it's good enough to retire, right? So, so I ran one, and I guarantee you, I never have and never will run another one intentionally. But, but so, what does that story have to do with the race of life? See, pacing is not only an effective strategy in running, it's an effective strategy in life. Let's take a look, a deeper look at the scripture that we saw earlier, Hebrews 12.1. It says, therefore, and remember one of our rules of Bible interpretation is if you ever see the word therefore, you stop and find out what it's there for. Because when it starts out with therefore, it's talking about something that it has previously said So you want to go back and look at what that is. Now, in this case, Hebrews 11, that comes right before this, is called the Hall of Faith. And it's talking about all these great men of God that had done these great things. David, Samson, you know, all these Abraham, all these people that have done these great things. So it tells that, and then it says, therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, it's almost like there's these stands in heaven seated with all these people cheering us on in this race of life. So since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, they're witnesses to this life of faith, Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. How many of you know you don't come up to the starting line with a heavy parka, all these heavy clothes, the big gold chain, Mr. T starter kit, you know, hanging around your neck. You don't have all these heavy things on you when you race. You take off all the extra weight so you can be as light as you can be. It goes on, it says, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. You know, one of the keys to winning a race is not tripping, right? I mean, you see a race, typically a track race, and you see a guy and two guys are running really close together. Typically, it's a guy in front that, that their, their feet you know, click together, and the guy trips and falls down. How many of you know, to get back in the race, he has to give his everything after he gets back up and and catches up, that he doesn't have what it takes to finish. So typically, tripping is going to get you out of the contention of the race. So especially the sin, how many of you have been tripped up in life by sin? Sin easily trips us up, it says, and let us run with endurance. Notice it doesn't say to run with speed or to run with strength. It says to run with endurance, the race that God has set before us and never quit. See, I think it's interesting that it says the race that God has set before us. Because I think so often we are running the race that we have set before us. Not the race that God has set before us, but the race that we have set before us. And they often look very similar. They often have the same destination. We're, We're going after the same thing. Why? Because God has given us the desires of our heart. So we have this desire to go after in life, and that desire is God-given. So the destination may be the same, 
So what's different? It is different pit stops on the way. Come on, somebody. When's the last time you saw somebody running a marathon? They're in the middle of this race, and they see a porn shop over here. Oh, I think I'm going to stop off and watch some pornography. Or, or they're running a, a marathon. They're in the middle of a marathon, and they're like, whoa, there's a casino over there. I'm going to stop and, and gamble away my mortgage payment at the casino. Or they're running this marathon, they look down this alley, and there's some guys shooting heroin. Oh, I think I'm going to stop and shoot some heroin. No, when you're running a race, the race that God has set before you, you don't have time for that other stuff. Because you're running a race, you're involved in a race. In the race of life that God has set before us, we don't have time for that other stuff. When you do that other stuff, you're running the race that you have set before you, not the race that God has set before you. When you're running the race that God has set before you, you're not distracted by those things because you're in the middle of a race. So how do we do that? How, how do we run that race? Well, I'm glad you asked, because in verse 2, the very next verse, it tells us exactly how to do this. It says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith. He initiated it. He started the whole thing. He gave us the faith to believe in him. He started the whole thing, and then he perfects it in the journey. Another version says, these words can be translated this way, says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, he authored our faith, I'm sure there's lots of Harry Potter experts, lots of people that have studied Harry Potter, know all the stuff about Harry Potter, but if you want to know something about Harry Potter, who do you go to? J.K. Rowling, right? Because she's the author. She's the author of Harry Potter. She made him up. She created him. There is nothing about Harry Potter that didn't come from J.K. Rowling. She's the author of Harry Potter. Jesus is the author of us. He created us. He started the whole thing. If we want to get to the end of our story, we need to keep our eyes on him. Just like me keeping the, my eyes on, on my friend in that race, in the 5K, caused me to run the best mile that I've ever ran in my life. Keeping our eyes on Jesus will get us to live the best life, the life that he designed for us the life that he authored. He wrote the story. He wrote the story about our life. We need to keep our eye on him because he knows the story. It goes on to say, because of the joy he could see waiting for him, he endured the cross disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Now, some people may think this is kind of a side note, but I think this is crazy cool. See, to me, the Bible is amazing. I don't think you could make this stuff up. People that criticize the Bible, I think they just must never have studied it. Because it is so amazing. And this is one of those things. Here's the thing that I think is so amazing. See, Jesus endured the cross. It tells us why. Because 
of the joy he could see waiting for him. What was that joy? It was us. He saw us. He saw us living this life, redeemed, forgiven, living the life that God has uh, designed for us. He saw that. So here's the cool part. Jesus endured the cross by keeping his eyes on us. We live the life that he designed for us by us keeping our eyes on us. On him. So what does that look like? What, what does it actually look like to keep our eyes on him? And I know this is going to sound like I'm doing my job, but here's what it looks like. <laughs> it looks like this. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, it looks like the Bible. Well, you're just trying to get us to read the Bible. Very perceptive, grasshopper. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm just trying to get us to read the Bible. I am trying to get us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Now, here's why. In John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is Jesus. So when we are keeping our eyes on this, when we are reading this, we are keeping our eyes on Jesus. Now, there's many ways to do this. I'm just finishing up, almost done. Many ways to do this. Obviously, church, coming to church is one of them, right? Because you come to church and you hear the, the Bible, you hear the Word, and you're keeping your eyes on Jesus. But that's only once a week. I don't think that keeping our eyes on Jesus just for one hour a week is enough. There's other ways, Bible studies, midweek Bible studies, come on men, I hope you show some interest so that we can have that midweek gathering of, of studying the Bible, that's another way. Another way is Bible-based devotionals. Now, personally, I have never been a devotional kind of guy, they're great. Mark actually is a devotional. He, he does a daily devotional, and a, a lot of times he'll share things that he got out of his daily devotional. Super powerful, it's just for me, it's never been that, but, but it could be for you. I recommend, um, especially to the business people that I coach, I recommend reading the book of Proverbs every day. I don't think it's a coincidence that there's 31 chapters of Proverbs, so you can read one chapter every day, and the 31st one is so powerful, you only need it once every other month. But, but you can read a chapter on the first of the month, like today you'd read Proverbs chapter 1, on the second you'd read Proverbs chapter 2. And the thing why I recommend that is because there's so much wisdom in the book of Proverbs I guarantee you that what you read, you will encounter in your life later that day, probably. So, so that, that's another way that you can do it. Another one great way is Bible reading plans. If you don't have version on your phone or something similar, you should get it. Because version, the, the Bible app, it has these Bible reading plans. And typically, I mean, even for a slow reader like myself, they only take like maybe five to ten minutes to read the daily reading for that day, but you're getting the word into your life. You're keeping your eyes on Jesus. It will even send you notifications to remind you. So the, the last way, and this is not for everybody, this is what works for me, I study the Bible. Now, that's different than reading. For me, you know, I am not a great reader. Like, when I just read the Bible, and some of you may be like this, I start at the top of the page, and I get to the bottom of the page, and I go, uh, what did I just read? 
Because in my mind, I'm solving all the world's problems, right? My mind is off somewhere else, and I don't really get what I read. But when I study, and study is different, study is you, you're, you read one section, you see something in there, and then you go, oh, but it talks about that over here. And, you know, studying the Bible, you kind of bounce around and study more of a subject than you do just reading. But out of that list, find something that works for you so that you are in the Word to keep your eyes on Jesus. And then the next step is, I try to filter everything I do through what I know about Jesus. Now, here's the sad truth, and I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't tell you the truth, right? The sad truth is most Christians have their God life, which is going to church and all their God stuff over here, and they have their everyday life over here, and the two never connect. They, they do their God thing, you know, I do my duty, you know, I pray sometimes, and I go to church, and, you know, but that's over here, but the way they live their everyday life is over here. See, what I try to do, and I'm far from perfect on this, but what I give my effort to is bringing the two together, so that my God experience, my learning about Jesus connects with my everyday life. So when you do that, and again, I try to bring them together so everything I do in life, I run it through Jesus. Does that make sense to everybody? So every thought in my head, every decision I make, every action I take, I try my best to have it be something that I feel is congruent with Jesus. I hope that makes sense. So, something that I feel like, you know, I, 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 I think Jesus would be for this. I think this goes along with what I know about Jesus. And just finishing here, um, let me share this, this little example. It's an extreme example. I understand that. But I think it illustrates this well. I won't end with this because it's a pretty weird story, but I'll... I'll spin it back around to something good. But say there's this man, businessman, and he's married, and, and you know, he's struggling a little bit with his wife, and, and uh, he has this really good-looking secretary. And the secretary is really friendly, you know, r- really, really friendly. Does everybody get the picture? She's, like, really friendly. And this one time... She goes a little bit farther, and she invites him over for dinner to her place. And he knows what that means, right? He he knows what the end result of that is going to be. See, unfortunately, I think most guys, what they meditate on is, will I get caught? So they're weighing their options based on will they get caught. What I'm seeing is how about weigh your options on what does Jesus think about this? Now I know that's an extreme example. But we know the answer, right? We we know definitely the guy's going to say no if he weighs it that way. And so what I'm saying is In life, all the decisions that we make, all the actions that we take, even the thoughts in our head, let's like sift them through Jesus. 
Does Jesus want me to do this? Does Jesus want me to meditate on these things? When we do that, that's when we're going through the race of life, keeping our eye on Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful that you gave us this incredible tool, your word, Jesus made known to us. God, I pray that each and every one of us, we put that tool into practice in our life, God. We get the word into us so we can keep our eyes on Jesus, so we can filter the things that we do in life through him. God, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, next week we'll be continuing with this series, Just Breathe. And I'm going to be sharing some examples, kind of going off of, you know, what we did last week and blessing those families and just talk about some of the other things that have happened in our church that is um, so powerful. So I I hope to see you back next week for that. Um, After the service, we're going to have some great fellowship time but it's going to be without coffee. Ah, Don't freak out. The place that we get our coffee, because it's New Year's Day, was closed today. So we don't have coffee, but we still have friendly faces and good conversation. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week.